have a, a lot of folks in here, and I think we're going to get right to it. Uh, because this will be recorded, we'll be uh, putting this out to uh, to YouTube and such. Um, we'll uh, we'll get right into it. And Paul Brody from Ernst and Young is uh, is first up. So Paul, would you like to say a few words? And York, I just unmuted you um, so that you can, I think, be able to uh, mute and unmute yourself. Um, Nick, I'll do the same thing for you. And it Nick, needs to ask a second level of confirmation. When you unmuted me, I had to confirm that. I don't know if Paul is in a place that he can do that or not. Yeah, I'll check with Paul in a second here. And Nick, I just made you uh, a co-host, so that should help. And Paul might be, yep. Whatever you did, we're not allowed to unmute. There we go. There, there we go. go. Yes, thank you. I, I have been unmuted, but I'm I'm uh, I'm kind of fine where we are. Thank you. Um, so this will be a little bit of a, a, a useful Q and A, and that's all we're really hoping for, right? We want to set some reasonable expectations about what will be released very shortly, and uh, and take questions and and give some answers. I. Think. So that was Paul Brody, everybody from Ernst and Young, uh, one of the founders of this project. And um, we're going to have a, a, a lot more uh, folks uh, coming in. And uh, Nick, it would be great if you uh, kept an eye on, I'd be grateful if you could keep an eye on uh, questions and raising hands. Uh, we're looking forward to those comments and we will paste the comments into the public Slack um, at the close of this. Uh, right, so real quick, what we're going to go through are the uh, overview of the announcement. And the uh, got a lot of thanks to give to the team. We'll do that briefly. Um, we got somebody off 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 mic. Oh, yep, yeah, that's uh, sorry, John. That, that was York Rose from Microsoft. I just wanted to say, um, uh, really looking forward to the session and uh, happy to be along on the journey. So, it's been a pleasure really working with you and Paul over the past and the team, obviously, uh, over the past n number of months. Well, we sure glad are glad you're here. And um, it, 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 for the record, uh, not, you know, a lot of this wouldn't be happening if uh, if you hadn't used your good offices to get the team together. So, thank you for that. All right. Um, so we're going to go through the Radish 34 uh, demo and the baseline protocol very briefly. Talk about whens and hows. How you get involved. Really, the the purpose of this is to make sure that when the repo is released in, in before the end of March that you're not surprised by what you see, that you're, you're excited, that you can get involved, you know where to go, what to do, and how you can get value out of this for yourself. And I'd like to say just before we get into this, uh, uh, our thoughts are, are with all the, all, everybody's families and, uh, and folks who are worrying about um, what's happening in the, uh, out there in the world. Um, we're, we're grateful that you're spending time with us on this. And um, in these times, you know, folks, some of us have been around for a few of these, uh, these big uh, scary moments in history. And um, I will say that innovation uh, tends to suffer, but there's one kind of innovation that doesn't suffer in times like this. And that's innovations where we are it, of the type that make it easier for the things we already have to get more value for less money. And I should hope that you agree that where we're going with the baseline protocol does exactly that. And so I'm, I'm rather hopeful personally that we have uh, something that will be relevant no matter what comes forward in the, in the coming months. So with that, a uh, quick overview of the announcement. Um, the, the announcement last week, if you didn't catch it, was uh, yeah, Ernst & Young and, uh, and, and Consensus put out two press releases that generated 260 articles in a epic 1.2 billion in reach, with an effective, um, in other words, if you if you wanted to get that kind of reach, you'd spend 11 million dollars in advertising. Um, that is, I haven't seen those kinds of numbers in a long time. It's uh, it's remarkable. And what's even more remarkable is, uh, by comparison to some other announcements that generated more articles, like twice as many, they usually uh, the, the ones that we looked at generated about tenth of the reach. And that speaks to the power of the message. And I think the message is powerful. So that's the first thing we want to go over. Um, it is now, it really is time to, to, to say something about the teams um, and some of the folks on those teams who have gotten us to this place. Obviously, uh, Paul Brody and his team at Ernst & Young are, they should be already legendary, that they got a, a, an organization 
the likes of, uh, of a, of a hundred year old accounting firm to do such a remarkable R and D with such an uh, amazing amount of commitment and effort and money spent folks like uh, Karthik uh, Solopram, who's on this, on the call and will be speaking later. Uh, great leadership on the technology side. Um, Brian Chamberlain, who's uh, also on, on the call. Um, just one of the, you know, solid uh, developer, uh, lead developers out there, knows what he's doing. Um, many more people, Tyler uh, uh, from Ernst & Young, who uh, who has kept us on a straight and narrow and made sure that we got things done, that we, we had operational integrity. Uh, many folks to thank um, and no time to do it. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Also, York Rhodes, who you, uh, you saw heard earlier from Microsoft, whose good offices really did uh, get Ernst & Young and Consensus together where it might not have happened otherwise and supported us throughout the process. And then for the um, many firms that have come forward, 14, which is three short of what Hyperledger launched with in, in 2015. Um, and all we have received since then are more companies, notable ones that want to get involved, want to know what's going on, calling for briefings, major, major U.S. bank um, having a briefing with us later today. Um, it's been astounding, the, the uh, reaction. I've been saying if you, if you can think of a big company, um, there's a good chance that they called us in the last week. Um, and the Ethereum Foundation um, and the EEA, both uh, supporting the Oasis uh, organization, which is, has been amazing at getting us uh, to uh, organize, organize so that we have a proper open source uh, operation. Uh, it's one thing to put out an open source uh, uh, repo on Git or uh, uh, on GitHub. It's another thing to have a real um, organization behind it. And Oasis is legendary. If you know SGML and, and SAML and other major uh, you know standards in, in the internet, Oasis was there. They've been around forever. And um, so there, uh, uh, this project would be kind of akin to um, Hyperledger is to Linux Foundation what we are to Oasis. And the uh, enterprise or the Ethereum Oasis project, which Jory, I might get you to talk about a little bit later if we have, t if we have time. I know people have a lot of questions, so I'll move on from there. All right, the Radish 34 and baseline protocol. So Radish 34 was a, is a product or project that envisions what it would be like for a supply chain product and uh, SCM supply chain management product in particular, or, or several of them, to baseline themselves. Now, we started by saying just simply, we didn't have the notion of baselining. We just said, we, have, um, we think we have the technology now and the, and the know-how to do things with the uh, public Ethereum mainnet that um, would be acceptable to the likes of the of, of, a, of a conservative, security-minded um, corporate uh, technology executive or, or officer. And um, Paul Brody and team are so experienced in supply chain that we chose supply chain and particularly procurement as the use case for this POC. The learning from that POC was amazing, and it became clear uh, towards the fourth quarter of last year that a, a, a protocol and open source, open standards protocol in particular, needed to happen. Right. And, and I think, you know, John, this was, you know, the, <clears throat> I think this is something that you pointed out, and it's really important to sort of really emphasize, you know, the, the prototype process that we've created is very focused on um, a single business process, but the goal isn't to manage a single business process. The goal is to create a generalized protocol. And so one of the key things that we're looking for as this goes forward is continued maturing of this towards something that's much more general purpose. And what doing this particular process helped us do is come up with two really important sort of uh, additional concepts, which is, first of all, the one that John has, has coined so nicely, which is baselining, right? Um, using the blockchain, the Ethereum uh, public blockchain as a mechanism for uh, 
uh, synchronization and middleware. And then secondly, not leaving the internet native or blockchain native concept of tokenization behind. So it, it's, it's at the intersection of these two that this will run. And so I think, you know, John's been uh, very helpful uh, in sort of thinking about how you combine those two together. And of course, he uh, came up with the baseline name as well. I can't take full credit for the name, but thank you for that. Um, uh, actually, it was an engineer that uh, came up with the pattern and took two weeks and we kind of figured out a name from it from there, which I, I, my favorite names are, are actually engineer generated names anyway. So uh, it does seem to be a, an auspicious name. Thanks for that. And I, I'd like to double down on that, uh, that yes, the, the tokenization is, is, is an important concept, in, even in baselining. Uh, but the, the important thing is to do tokenization in such a way that you're not giving away secrets to your competitors. And um, I think that as we get into the baseline protocol, you'll see that, that, is, um, that, that the, the technique of doing that is, is not only private, but stealthy. And... Uh, but still conferring the same benefits of tokenization that you would normally expect. The, the repo will release before the end of the month, as we've said, and the task groups will be forming to address technical priorities and vertical cases. We will have a technical steering committee of 11 members. We've decided that's the number. We, we've considered seven, nine, 11, many more. 11 is the right number. Uh, I, I won't go into the details of that, but it, you know, that's the number. And um, we already have oversubscribed. The number of people that want to be uh, technical steering uh, committee members is double that. And we're uh, going through a process that we didn't really expect to have to do where we're vetting candidates and figuring out because, because everybody is worthy of that of the, in that candidacy group, you know, where, how can they lead even if they're not technically on the TSC? Anybody who's been involved in an open source project before will know that the real power and the real activity is with the maintainers and the committers. Um, the TSC's job is mainly to deal with market failures where the committers can't, and the maintainers can't uh, agree on something and they need, or they need bootstrapping to get uh, the initial maintainers in, in right? But, uh, and, and set rules like uh, how many maintainers are needed to, to commit a, p a pull request, et cetera. So the TSC will be announced next week early. Wanted to do it this Friday, but we just need more time to vet all the can candidates now. Um, and yes, the repo will re release shortly thereafter. Um, we're not ready to announce the date, but we have the date um, that we want, and we need a couple more days to make sure that we can live up to that commitment. And um, it's really important to note, I don't know if Tosh Deans is on yet, uh, but uh, this is really a... a, a a joint effort with the EEA main network, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance main networking group, which itself is a joint effort with the Ethereum Foundation. So we're all kind of getting together here. We're, and this is an epic moment, right? This is a, a sea change in how things have been going up over the last five years. We've had all this bifurcation, all this Byzantine, you know, different, you know, you know there was a Cambrian explosion in blockchains. There was a Cambrian explosion in uh, philosophies around blockchain. And you had public versus private, you had enterprise versus up and comers. And this is a great example of not that. This is a, gr a great example of convergence, of working together, of saying, well, I'm, I'm a startup, but I also have the same is issues and interests and needs as many enter enterprises. Um, I'm in the, Ethereum in, in the Ethereum Foundation, you're in the uh, EEA. Um, we can work together. The, these aren't separate things. Um, and that's we, a lot of us have been looking forward to that day, and I think that day is here. Why baseline your systems and offerings? Um, is the fifth uh, so future proofing your legacy systems without major modification and increasing their utility by going from not simply being able to tell you what you know but being able to on a good day when you get the data right and you didn't fat, fing, fat finger an entry. Um, to not only knowing what you know with greater reliability, but also on a record by record basis, on a business process by business process basis, knowing with confidence, with validation, what your counterparties know without letting everybody in the world know everything you're doing. Well, you know, so record number one is private and confidential and stealthy to just you and me. Workflow step number two might involve 20 different 
organizations. And the 20 different organizations may not know a thing about what you and I knew from the previous workflow step. We call that atomic compartmentalization, but because we're doing that on the main net, we're, we have no silos. So work, workflows can interoperate um, without having to call a network work administrator and figure out whose blockchain is going to win the which blockchain are we going to use contest. What is not baseline? Baseline is not a product. It's not a platform. It's not a chain. It's not a coin. It's not a scheme. It, think of it more as a design pattern that anybody's product can, can employ. And frankly, a, a competent team could deploy it tantamount to in production today. Um, so if you're thinking, well, this is innovation for the future, sort of, but it's a pattern that you, you know, if you're a solutions team, you can do it right now. There's a, there's a small uh, solutions team that has already built a, 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 a deployment and they've had the code uh, for six days. So um, there's, yes, it is um, a, a new thing, but it's really supporting an old thing and it's approaching the blockchain in, a, in sort of a, uh, in a way that people who've been around for 20, 30 years would recognize as a sensible pattern. One that doesn't make them have to compromise things like where, how many threat surfaces you're running or um, moving your data from where you've always had it to somewhere else or, or, or what have you. This is also, so baseline, baseline protocol is a way for enterprises to use the public mainnet and we, we're, you know, yeah, we're trying to make mainnet a thing by saying it's the mainnet. It's the mainnet is a set of is a specification unto itself, saying we need something that's always on, that doesn't can't lock you out um, of valid operations, is always running, and is uh, is proof as possible against some group taking it over, comp, uh, changing history, or preventing you from doing things as possible. Um, a public good. And uh, yes, for our money right now, the Ethereum public mainnet is the best candidate to do that job for the internet. But so when you see, uh, at least, at least when, I, when I'm writing about things, and I think others on the team as well, um, when, they, when I write about mainnet, capital M, I'm talking about the notion of a public mainnet, a state machine for the public internet. And we want to do that without compromising information security. So putting data on the mainnet isn't necessarily a great idea, um, but the, using the mainnet's ability to have data and have expressive smart contracts and tokenization to serve as, in a, as a form of middleware, in particular uh, enterprise service bus between um, entities when you're doing business process integration across companies. And we'll talk about that in a minute. There are great explainers here at this link. I know that you can't click that link, but I, that's why I bit lead it down. And here is the, where the repo will be um, as soon as it goes live. You don't go there now, you'll get a 404. But um, when it goes live in public, you'll be able to go there. Um, and the goal is to drive standards, specs, input into the mainnet efforts, and get many products baselined. So if you have a product, don't worry about baseline being another product you have to worry about. It's not. You're the product. And we will support you as a community if you're using baselining in, in powerful ways. So that's the way to think about this. I hope everybody understands. I'm going to look at some questions here real quick. Um, uh, we've got one from Clemens. Um, how's the performance for setting up the secret and retrieving validation others have confirmed? Is there a notification message bus for streaming parties uh, have accepted reviews? This is a pretty advanced question. So Clemens, maybe we can get to that. Uh, keep, Nick, keep me honest. Let's make sure we get to that question. But I think to answer it right now, we might be blowing a pass of some, some basics. Okay. Fair enough. Yep. Um, let's see. Also a three-part transaction where one transaction's failed because of a timeout strand of both money and the data. Interesting. And Scott, today's clogging of main net certain, uh, Shows us the limits. Oh, transaction that cost me uh, five cents yesterday is over $10 today. I bet Paul has a lot to say about that one. I know it's a black swan event, but you know, and th yeah, this has to do a lot with a more general case of uh, noisy neighbor issues and other things that might well certainly be very concerning if you're trying to build an application that runs on 
the public main net, but uh, I think you'll see that, and I think we'll all see as we as we get into this more um, in the coming months that uh, placing the main net in the position of a piece of middleware, a bulletin board, uh, gives you a lot more forgiveness around that. Right. I'll just add here a couple of things. You know, we are using Whisper, which I don't think is is. I could be wrong here, and 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 Karthik, you should keep me honest here, right? I think um, you can use Whisper even if the mainnet is congested. Well, right? more to the uh, point, even if we aren't, yeah, Whisper is what we used in the demo. Well, we definitely want to use a uh, see a, a a more powerful um, a, right. a, a messaging but, protocol come up. Uh, the the only other thing I would add, uh, Karthik, maybe is um, whether using the notarization function or creating and moving tokens, right? Um, you know, even when the, the network is congested, you're still, you know, have a fairly significant amount of time that you can use to get things done. Enterprise transactions are, and and we're not talking about sort of Wall Street trading transactions. Most enterprise transactions are kind of, as I like to joke, you know, the thirty and net thirty is days. Right. So as long as your transaction is done in, inside of a day, I think you're fine. Uh, that's kind of probably our, our initial take at this point. That's well said. I agree. Um, and Karthik, I just made you a co-host so you can you can chime in at will. Um, let's get into the, the architecture very simply. Um, and, and you'll see that if you if you go to this uh, explainer, there's there's some great stuff. Um, the, uh, Paul, Paul did a really great piece and then I wanted to um, not do another piece elsewhere. So I put it right underneath his piece, uh, sort of a, the, my sense of the transaction workflow. This is a kind of a pretty picture or at least a unnecessarily, uh, it, it, I like the picture. It kind of gives you something to look at, um, but it does uh, ask for some explaining. So yeah, it, baseline server is a, is again, is a specification. You could be say SAP or uh, Ops Chain, uh, which is EY's product or any other product uh, in the space that's doing ERP, CRM, SCM, anything like that. And you could make your system baseline enabled, then you wouldn't need a separate server, but you, you know, we, are, we have defined a, a set of server components that anybody could make a product out of um, or could integrate into their product. So again, it's a specification and a reference implementation that can be used by anybody, and it is public domain. And what's involved in that is a is some pretty normal. You know, think of it like Legos, right? The, the Legos themselves are pretty known, boring, except for one. And we'll discuss that one. And uh, it's the composition of those boring Legos that makes it an interesting pattern. So uh, messaging is something we know. EDDSA, a, a, a digital signatures, are something we know. System record integration, translation, things we know. Um, and we know smart contracts and we know the mainnet. We know blockchain. And we also come to know uh, uh, zero knowledge proofs. These are all Legos that we've assembled in a certain way so that we're not simply, um, as you might uh, suspect, hashing data onto a blockchain or onto the New York Times classified section to, you know, say, to have proof of existence. This is more like proof of entanglement or proof of consistency. And that right away gives you proof against repudiation. So if anybody's familiar with, you know, businesses, um, you know, being able to say, Hey, I didn't get that memo or I didn't, you know, I didn't agree to that is a, is a trillion dollar problem right there. And uh, you can solve that with digital signatures, but having a common frame of reference where those, the proofs of those digital signatures goes is important. But it's only the first step. That would be, you know, kind of boring, even more boring than, you know, we like to say embrace the boring, right? This is supposed to be boring. This is boring IT using the mainnet. And from that perspective, yeah, we're using hashing, we're using uh, digital signatures, we're using messaging, and, but we're doing it in an interesting pattern where you get this workflow flow control and you can deal with things like uh, distributed systems issues trying to connect your system with somebody else's system without making those two systems, either one being the, 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 the primary and the others being secondary or having to pay capital expense to set up some system integration middleware somewhere, um, be that Kafka or MQ series or any other kind of thing. York, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you, you want to say before we move? Oh, I can still unmute. Yeah, I made you a co-host. Yeah, that's great. Um, 
So, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of flexibility here in the system to be determined additional capabilities there, you know, this is really designed as, uh, as John said earlier, a pattern and a, and a template uh, that is a good jumping off point for people to take it further. Um, and this is the reason why we've bundled it under the umbrella that we've done so that that is possible to happen. Um, as an example, I don't know, I didn't hear you mention this before, John, but there actually is a uh, messaging uh, task force that's spinning up inside the uh, main networking group in the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, specifically to look at enterprise requirements for uh, messaging uh, capability uh, to replace or enhance Whisper, as an example. Yeah, so that and that's right. So the, the messaging protocol in particular is very important. We did use Whisper to begin with um, because it was there. And I've said before, I think publicly, you know, I think one of the things that could be really exciting is to go into the Corda um, flows uh, public uh, open source repo and, and, and take some tricks from that. And uh, I'd love to see a day where, you know, Corda flows are the messaging protocol for Ethereum. That would, I would enjoy that. It's factually true that the Corda flows architecture is quite powerful for point-to-point -point stateless secret messaging without getting into while, while avoiding blocking and, um, and having more elegant code for handling uh, live, live connections. It's quite impressive. We should look at it. Um, so John, there's a, there's a question uh, with respect to is baseline only willing to work with Ethereum based projects um, from Rashan Khan that might be a good time to, to speak to that. Thanks. That's a great question. From my point of view, we call it the mainnet because the mainnet is the mainnet. It's a specification for what we need as a society. Ethereum is a pretty good candidate for that. Um, I, for one, will go to whatever becomes a better candidate for that that is also going to win heart, hearts and minds and become a standard, um, which I think the, the Ethereum community just simply trumps all on that matter. So, and, and it's, stay, it's continuing, which is re remarkable, it's staying innovative. In other words, you know, it's not locked into just protecting the value of its coin or whatever. Um, it is, it, it, it's got a great roadmap. This obviously tracks with ETH2, but I will hasten to say that you can use baselining approach with ETH1 just fine. You know, it's not going to be as fast and you're going to have to deal with maybe some concerns about noisy neighbor, but as Paul Brody will point out, the, the, a lot of those are trumped up and not as big of a deal as you'd think. Uh, certainly, depending on the, the use case. Max Gravit has a, a corollary to that same question. Uh, you mentioned that Ethereum is the best candidate for this. What criteria was used to determine that? Um, it, it, I think, as I said before, um, and, and, and we have a lot of work to do as a community to decide. I, I'm just speaking for myself about this. Um, the community will decide this. And, and let me reiterate, this is an openly governed open source project. Nobody is the hegemon. If you write the most and the best code and get the most things checked in, you're a maintainer. You can get on the TSC and the Oasis um, found uh, the Oasis organization and our project governance board will make sure that we do not violate that. And they are not part of the TSC. From that perspective, you know my my point of view is is simply that the most important thing to have in a mainnet is the is proof is being an expressive um uh backplane an expressive bulletin board that you can do things with um but that uh is proof against getting taken over by toll loving trolls locking you out or changing history it can be pretty slow frankly compared to other kinds of state machines as long as it's really good at that one thing show me something that's better than than ethereum at that um, and does that mean that we can't improve Ethereum? Absolutely not. There's already a project going on to get enterprises into the act of helping maintain the integrity of the, of the ledger by mining and staking as known entities. Think of that for a minute. It's somewhat related um, from Lucas, who's a, a mainnet Ethereum enthusiast. Uh, what do you see in baseline or ETH mainnet? that you do not see in Hyperledger? Hyperledger is, first of all, when you say Hyperledger, I mean, which project in Hyperledger are you asking about? And, um, you know, Hyperledger Besu is an Ethereum client. And I should expect that the standards from baseline protocol, if we do our jobs right, will go into 
things like Hyperledger Besu, but also I could see it going into many other Hyperledger projects because it's just a sensible pattern. Um, in fact, it's not far off from something that uh, Hyperledger Fabric is doing, but would do, frankly, better, I think, if it involved using the mainnet as uh, the component that they're using for this extra privacy group function. Um, you know, that would, it would further obfuscate the, um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're sniffing around on a particular fabric channel and you see activity and you're in a very small group, you can figure out a lot of things, even if you have this privacy group going. Um, I, I was going through that code the other day. And, um, and so that's a perfectly good pattern. It's not dissimilar to the way baselining works, but working together would be even better. I just wanted to add a perspective. Like I think uh, when we chose uh, Ethereum, uh, one of the main proponents for choosing Ethereum was our drive to move from uh, many, many networks of private blockchains that are out there, uh, which more, more often than not have an interoperability problem or an identity management problem. So we started with Baseline as a first step to rationalize or consolidate all efforts of private Ethereum efforts to a common standard or a common infrastructure or a common landscape that everyone can work on and reliably use. The mainnet is more or less a public uh, infrastructure. With respect to other ledgers that are out there like Hyperledger and Corda and others, and they're all uh, very good and viable candidates. And one of the objectives while we were designing Baseline was to make sure that while we are building these different components, at some point, as the community gets involved, there are other proponents like Hyperledger and Corda and others which will make its place, will, which will make their place. And there are existing projects that interoperate between other ledgers and Ethereum. So when we designed uh, the baseline protocol, one of the things that we also took into consideration was when we are, uh, even when we are interacting with the mainnet, we don't necessarily put any parts of the business logic on the mainnet. Um, business logic or the data that is used, that is to be used by the enterprises, that uh, never enters the mainnet. Or for that matter, if, even if it's a different ledger, it, the point is to not let these data or logic leave the legacy systems or the legacy landscape. So in that regard, any of the proponents that we have, as John and Paul were pointing out, uh, and Yoko pointing out earlier, this is, these are extensions that could be replaced. Like for example, uh, as it was pointed out, messaging could be replaced by uh, a better messaging protocol or a better distributed, uh, mess distributed system. Uh, similarly, where we are using privacy aspects like um, zero knowledge proofs, there are, uh, there are ways to even uh, take zero knowledge proofs and actually interoperate them across other ledgers as well. So in, in short, uh, just adding uh, color to what uh, John was saying is that uh, baseline protocol is more of a, an approach how we can uh, rationalize efforts on moving away from multiple private blockchains and interoperability efforts towards a common standard and a common public infrastructure, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, Karthik. I think that's well said. Important thing uh, to remember is that there are um, there are, is a series of components, and I think we should go through them right now. Maybe Karthik, you, you maybe go off mic or off mute, and uh, you and I can kind of walk folks through this. Maybe we can uh, buddy system this. Um, so, you know, the, the workflow here. I have a record in my ERP system. I'm going to baseline that and to you. You're, you're my counterparty. It's a uh, we're going to share. We're going to agree on a master service agreement uh, for purchasing. We're going to agree on a tiered pricing structure for a volume discount. So anything under 100 units, I get no discount. Uh, over 100 units, I'm going, to, I'm going to get a 10% discount. We're going to agree to that. It's in a record. And then instead of putting that on a blockchain or on some other system, we're going to, you're going to, I'm going to leave it in my database. I'm going to message it to you by a secret messenger. I'm going to send with it some other uh, elements in the payload that will allow you to deposit that in your database, run some process. Now you're running the same process as I am, verifiably. Uh, you're gonna digitally sign that, send it back to me. Uh, my baseline server will, will use its uh, zero knowledge service to verify that, that we both did the same thing and have the same thing. And then we're gonna send a proof and some other payload up to the mainnet into a shield contract which was set up during, when we set up our relationship. So that could be with a bunch of other companies or just you and I, where three smart contracts were put onto the mainnet by a registrar uh, factory. Karthik, you want to take it away from there? Uh, yeah. 
So as Jim was saying, uh, one of the aspects of, of the baseline protocol is how we are classifying or categorizing different uh, different pieces or different Lego blocks. If you think about the procurement example, like uh, as, uh, as John was pointing out, one of the things that we did was a good use of baseline protocol, a good use of uh, a good way to uh, manifest a baseline protocol is to apply it to a well-ordained use case, which is spans across industries, but also something where we have where we can test out or emphasize the importance of some of the core concepts that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in when it comes to blockchain. It's like notarization, traceability, uh, tokenization are some of the core concepts that we come across in blockchain, which have uh, which have enterprise value or latent enterprise value. So when we talk about uh, the procurement process, the way we, we came about uh, came up with it was that there are processes there where there are negotiations between between parties, processes where there are uh, with the notarizations or you know cosigns or uh, mutual agreements that that basically posit the the future process or the subsequent process, and there are processes that uh, which have material value or a uh, or a monetary monetary value. So in that regard, what we started off with is saying that RFP, we, we pretty much like try to layer it up with each process. Like for example, when we started off with an RFP, RFP is basically uh, without any other bells and whistles at the core, RFP is a process where um, two parties interact with each other to exchange uh, documents. And in this process, we, we, thought, we said, okay, the most basic way to use this is uh, use a, use something like a secure uh, messaging protocol. So that's the most underlying base, base component of baseline is that you want to exchange documents in the clear or rather exchange documents in a private manner or in a, in a private channel. In the future, the RFP uh, can, more, uh, can actually be extended to more and more bearings such as uh, negotiations and other constraints that may come up with ac accepting RFPs. But RFP is like the most fundamental process where uh, we started off like trying to explain, like, assume that we start with only a private messaging channel. Then we layer up what happens when you add uh, the concept of notarization, which is when we go into the NMSA. Uh, I'll go into the details of NMSA. I'll rather defer uh, this uh, walkthrough, a high-level walkthrough of the slide to Patrick in a, in a minute. But uh, when it comes to MSA, one of the key aspects that we noted is that this is where the first layer of privacy uh, on the main net or in the clear starts to come into picture. We need a way for uh, two parties to agree upon terms uh, in such a way that one party can uh, attest for other other party by by verifying that the other party has mutually agreed or, or also has agreed upon to the terms that have been uh, set up in the original uh, original document. So, for example, in an MSA or a master service agreement, keeping aside all the nuances of whether RFP comes first or MSA comes first or the lifetime of an MSA and so on and so forth, uh, MSA is an agreement that is sent by, say, a buyer to a supplier to say that these are the terms of our uh, contract or the terms of our relationship uh, and this uh, or terms of a business relationship. And these terms are something that both of them have to sign. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we do not reveal the identity of who's signing the, the counterparty that is signing this particular uh, message or signing this particular document. So there we go. Karthik, right, let me just interrupt you very quickly. There's a couple of questions that are interesting that are apropos to what you're saying right now. Could you, um, could you tune this to kind of the elephant in the room is why do we need ZK um, for this process? Why isn't digital signatures uh, sufficient? So if you want to answer that in your, in your comments, I didn't want to lose the opportunity. Keep going. So the idea is that uh, you want to have a public trace of an agreement being agreed upon between two parties. But uh, like in a typical case, like in a, uh, uh, like in a supply chain, for example, buyers are okay in terms of letting the community or rather the public know or, uh, about the uh, RFPs or MSAs that are put out there. But they do not want to reveal, or rather, it's in the supplier's best interest to not be revealed about what they have quoted in response to a particular proposal or in response to a particular terms of a master service agreement. So it's important to hide the identity of the supplier in order to not let other suppliers know about what terms that they are accepting or what logical conditions they are uh, they're satisfying. So in order to, one way to do this is, yeah, definitely you can do this on the off, uh, off chain and uh, just have uh, signatures just alone, yeah, right? But then you don't, you gotta, you gotta set it up every time. You don't have a common sort of yeah, repository. Yeah. 
right? Yes. So, but if, when we talk about ZKP, one, one of the main things what you're looking at is how can we make sure that the information of the of the information of the counterparty is not revealed, like the identity of the counterparty is not revealed, but I can prove or I can rather verify to any party on the main net or any party on the on the on the on the, on the ledger such that the, the sign the document has actually been signed by a, a legitimate counterparty who has actually agreed upon to these terms. Uh, and then you can use that right as a state marker for yes. really much more interesting things in the in in subsequent w- workflow steps, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So that's, that's what it's exciting for yeah, me. That's, yeah, absolutely. That's where I think things start getting more interesting. With uh, uh, and I'll I'll allude to the question that Gary Mensa asked also about whether MSA can be an NFT. Uh, that's actually a great point. Uh, the reason uh, it could be an uh, NFT. Uh, and that's where I think we went uh, to that NFT process or a tokenization process in a subsequent step going from MSA to a purchase order. So in a purchase order, there are two things. Like one is that the purchase order must keep a track of the terms that are being agreed upon in the MSA, number one. Uh, and number two, if there are terms and conditions in the MSA and they are changing uh, over, uh, over a business process, like what I mean by that is, say for example, uh, in the in, or at least in the case of Radish, as a, as a sample, in, as a, a specific implementation of how baseline protocol could be leveraged, what we are assuming is that uh, uh, the terms of the MSA contain a discount structure, wherein depending on the number of quantity ordered or, or volume ordered, create uh, you can create subsequent purchase orders, which basically refer to the exact state of how many uh, how many uh, how much volume has been consumed for a given tier. So that's where we uh, we took the concept of MSA notarization and extended it to say that there's also a state marker, and these state markers act as a quote unquote trace uh, or traceability or validation to prove that PO is starting off or any purchase order is starting off from a correct starting state. And uh, the additional bearings that we had over there was that PO is something that is that is that could be tradable, that could be monetizable, and that's where PO can be treated as an NFT token. So that's and, and the cool thing here, isn't it, uh, Karthik, that you, I mean, uh, that PO, if, if two POs um, try to update themselves from, say, the original state of zero, right? So there's zero orders and there's a rate table that says over 100, I'll get a discount. Um, if, I, if I've got two or three POs that try to uh, calculate from zero, I have a problem. And that in, in traditional systems today, as Paul Brody knows very well, because he taught us this, he, he really pushed this issue. Revenue recognition becomes a real problem and you have to take a lot of time and that time is cash in bank for a small business, right? So being able to, to say the mainnet is going to prevent me from trying to update the state of the MSA twice is important, right? Because then I can get to revenue recognition faster. I've got two POs for 20. I need the third PO to, to calculate from 40, not from zero or 20 again. And um, you could you, you can run or follow that without a common frame of reference, a bulletin board that can uh, that has some magic powers, you don't really have the ability to be sure, right? No, that's right. So yeah, so sort of the, the, the same uh, attributes of the main net that, that allow you to do uh, anti double spend, you can also do anti double ex- uh, execute, right? Uh, yeah, the, the definitely we can uh, add in one can add in the levels to do so. The reason why we left out some of these nuances was because they they vary from industry to industry, but uh, the structure is there for anyone to expand upon, or uh, at least it's built in a in a in a an extendable interface format. The the other thing that's probably in, and we do have to wrap because uh, we'll, we're coming up on five minutes before the end of the hour, um, and we will do these more. Uh, the other other thing that might be very interesting is it, it, as a it, uh, industry standards bodies might be very interested in creating these libraries of, um, of of zero knowledge circuits, right? So that you can say not only do we have the same, did we execute the same code, we executed the same code verifiably in accordance with standard X. So if I'm a regulated company. I can say we can, I can say not only are my counterparties and I in sync, but we did it in the way that the industry requires to be compliant, and that's really cool. I mean, I, you know, it's clearly uh, you know, using uh, 
Snarks is uh, somewhat more expensive, although thanks to ENY's efforts, much less expensive than it was. But it, you know, in a lot of cases where you need to be compliant, a little extra expense could go a long way, right? Hey, uh, John, just to, um, Max followed up on that with um, essentially a conclusion. I'm not sure if that conclusion is 100% right. So can you just address that? I, I didn't understand that question. It's, it's York, yeah. So Max basically said, the per so the purpose of the zero knowledge proof is to prove to everyone else that the parties agreed to something without revealing what they agreed to. And I think the nuance, as I understand it, is actually you don't want other people to know that you necessarily agreed to something with another party. I'll put it this way, and, and Karthik, uh, check my math. Um, uh, the way I see it is that zero knowledge proof typically is thought of uh, as um, I have a secret and I'm going to prove to you I have the secret without telling you what the secret is. Uh, that's, the, that's my most succinct way of describing it. Zero knowledge. It works for me. Um, this is, we have a secret and we don't want anybody else to know that we even have a secret, Correct. but we need a common frame of reference to, be, to help us be sure that we have the same secret without telling that com common frame of reference anything that somebody looking at it could use to analyze what we were doing. Exactly. So the, the, the metadata problem, which is how much volume is going between two parties, um, is avoided through this, through this methodology. That's right. And so if you tried to throw um, a different, if say you changed your database um, uh, in the interim and now you, you have a different uh, from the MSA and you, you're calculating from 75 and, and there's never been 75 units uh, ordered, um, you're, you will not be able to place your new proof or nullify the original MSA state um, on the mainnet because you won't be able to. So, I mean, you can change your own database all you want, but now you are no longer in a state of consistency. Let me, let me just yeah. wind back the, the question again, John, because mm -hmm. you answered something different there. Um, the question is, what is exposed on this mainnet um, that would allow other parties to see that these two parties are working together or to see what volume of something, some types of transactions they might have. Is there so any the, 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 the material that is deposited on the mainnet is a, is a hash into a Merkle leaf of a Merkle tree inside a shield contract. And the point is you could point a, you know, the way we're doing it, um, especially if you do it properly and you have some, and you have the right, if you're doing it on a cadence with some chaff, um, an AI looking at the main net, um, trying to figure out who's doing what or trying to get some kind of classifier off of relationships you're, you're conducting or just to figure out what you're doing and what your business activities are, or what your relationships are, the, you know, to, the, to that AI, the activity would look like a metronome, tick, tick, tick. It would just, it gives up very little information, if, if any, other than that there's ticking going on. And it would look, you know, like noise, except for that one pixel of noise, you and I know means something because that hash means that we are in a state of consistency about this one record that we have. Um, and that the, this other hash means that it executed faithfully with the previous thing. Um, and so you can construct these really nice compartmentalized workflows without um, anybody knowing anything about one step or the other if they're not supposed to. York, did that, was that good? It answered it for me, yes. I don't know yeah. if Max still has a question or not. Yeah, so that's what goes on the mainnet. But what's, not, what's interesting isn't the hash. It's how the hash got there. And, um, yeah, and it should look like nothing to anybody who isn't involved in it. It just should, should look like sameness. We'd be like, oh, there's, there's a hash there. Somebody put a hash on the mainnet. Oh, oh, whatever, I don't know. Oh, uh, you know and, and, and if you do it right, you don't know which hashes mean anything at all. So most of, many of them might mean nothing. Okay, um, I want to I want to switch gears here and talk about um, what you're going to expect to see in uh, when we release the repo. So this is one of the things we're working real feverishly on right now. As you can imagine, documentation, the best documentation comes right at the end. So you start wiggling those fingers really fast. So, you know, this is, uh, this was what you'll see in the, in the, when we liven up the, the repo. And I'd love to see, by the way, uh, kudos to everybody that's been using the chat so well. 
We will put that into the Slack, uh, the baseline Slack channel, which you can get to by going to baseline hyphen uh, protocol.org and you can sign up for the Slack and we'll put this into the Slack. Uh, right, Jory, we can do that. And, um, and we can keep the conversation going from there because there's some great questions in here. We won't have time to go into. Um, but I wanted to show you this so that we can, so you can comment and say, Hey, you're missing something. You know, that's what we want to make sure is that, that you aren't surprised by what you see and that you're getting the information you need to do things when it goes live. So we have uh, getting started with, you know, so we're going to start with the Radish demo. You'll be able to go into the actual both Figma and live demo. You'll be able to build the demo. Um, and you'll, you can, you know, like I don't know anybody who's code who who saw it. the only code you love is the code you wrote yourself, right? So I'm sure that a lot of people have points of view about the code that was that's in there. Remember, it's POC code. It needs to be abstracted and then it needs to be generalized. And that is the job of the community. That's what we're here to do. So everything about this documentation should be preparing you to to uh, lead in your section of that world, um, as you know, whatever benefits you. Um, getting started, a visualization, modifying things. So, so where could you mod this? Like uh, if you wanted to write an invoice procedure, how would you mod what we have in the current demo to make it work for invoices? Um, and then uh, going from demo to protocol, we'll, well, talking about how you do that. I'm looking at the time here. Um, uh, my screen doesn't have a time on it. but uh, So uh, baseline protocol, um, uh, I see what languages were used. Um, uh, and Karthik, you might want to discuss that. I mean, we, we, one thing that, that is notable is that we're using GraphQL uh, for the for a lot of this. Um, we have uh, an open so the baseline protocol, open source community, how to get involved, what are the you know guidelines for contributing, the baseline process, something more or less what we just discussed. Stats and specs. So like how fast can you expect uh, and how much expense can you expect to see an MSA or a PO turn around under different conditions? Um, and, you know, obviously as we get more into this and we have more mainnet uh, deployments, we'll have better data on that. But we can speculate on a variety of things already. Uh, standards, driving mainnet evolution. So there are things, um, for example, point-to-point -point me messaging, Socrates support, Ethereum 2, what, what, what do we need to see Ethereum 2 do? A gas pump service for companies that uh, don't want to hold crypto in order to pay for, their trans, for, for their, uh, the gas on, uh, on, on running these proofs. And uh, barriers to enterprise adoption of public blockchain, um, which you can find on the, on the web uh, from the main networking group, um, uh, sort of the list of 10 top reasons. Um, we've got a roadmap section, components, right? The server, messenger, zero knowledge service, APIs. And this we're getting into um, what we want to do to build these components off of the Radish POC work. So we're going to take the Radish POC work and build a generalized server or a more abstracted server, you know, add a more abstracted set of uh, interfaces for messaging, et cetera, making this something that, that um, any... ERP, CRM, SCM, or any other system of record could integrate into their own product and sell quickly. Um, and then, uh, you know, how to baseline your product, supply chain management, ERP, core banking, enterprise middleware. Uh, we actually have a core banking team on, uh, in, already in Neocova, so I'm hoping that they'll, they'll do some work in there. Uh, and then baseline basics, Google Glossary and FAQ and such. Please uh, send us any uh, comments about things, the uh, other things, topics that you'd like to see in the documentation. We'd be grateful for that. John, we're, we're at the top of the hour. A um, couple of quick logistical questions. Where can folks find the recording of this call? And when will we hold the next session like this? Right. Um, we don't have a, 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 the next session scheduled. I think we should. Um, uh, you know, that's always tricky because you got to get the timing right. Um, let us say we will have a session. Paul, you have any thoughts on that? Might have lost Paul. Or, yeah. Oh, uh, I think um, my recommendation, but we should just wait until after the 19th of March, give people some time to uh, kind of absorb the content 
uh, and then uh, have another set. That's a good idea. Um, so I'd say, you know, maybe as early as, as next Friday, but not before next Friday. Um, and we'll, we'll figure that out going forward. And again, Jory uh, and team on the Oasis team, will make sure everybody is, is notified. Um, I, you know, I've, I've been, I used Twitter a lot. I didn't used to, but I've been for this. So you'll, you, you know, if you're following the Twitters, then you'll, you'll get there. Paul's been doing a lot with Reddit. We'll make sure you get the information about and, and keep you updated and the Slack, you know, just direct communication. Um, and as far as, uh, uh, what was the other part of the question? Sorry, Nick. So that was next, next meeting. Where are we going to post the recording? And we'll report, post the recording to YouTube, um, ASAP. And again, we'll, we'll make sure everybody knows where to go. Um, we'll try to post it properly. So it's easy to search for. Post the link in Slack or that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. We'll also post the link in Slack. Yep. Thanks everybody. Uh, I hope this was a useful session. And um, uh, please uh, check, check Slack um, if you want to continue the conversation. I saw some great questions in there. Thanks, thanks team. Thanks, thanks John, Thank Paul, Karthik, York, everyone. Appreciate it.